All right, all right, all right, all right. Well, um, thanks everyone for uh, coming out today. Um, we're um, I'll be I'll be doing a talk on static ice concurrency and Rust. Uh, scary title, maybe uh, less scary of a topic, because um, we'll 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 break it down. So hi, hello, um, how's it going? Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm Yash. Um, so who am I? Um, I'm a Rust developer advocate at Microsoft. Um, I'm a member of the Rust Async working group, and I live in Copenhagen uh, since last year. We 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 moved here last year from uh, Berlin, uh, where I yeah I I lived for like five years before. Um, so yeah, <laughs> huh. all right. So plan plan for today. We're um, going to be talking about uh, what async Rust is. Um, so you know, be, people may have seen it, but we you know got got, got to give a little explainer there. Um, then we're going to talk about the state of async Rust um, as it is right now, as it is today. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about async concurrency, and finally we are going to um, dive deeper in. One sec, gotta open the door here. We're gonna dive a bit deeper in um, and explain like static async concurrency, what that is, what we've got, what the designs are, what the plans are, uh, and hopefully we'll like do it in a little bit over half an hour. So you know we're 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 gonna go quick. Um, <laughs> hope it works. Oh, disclaimer: um, I'm on the async working group, but I I don't speak for the async working group. What I'm representing here will be like a little bit, a little bit of theory here and there, um, but mostly like my research, my opinions, my takes. Um, th this is all like not set in stone. If I say like, "Hey, we may go here," it doesn't mean we will go somewhere, you know. So um, don't don't take it as like gospel. Uh, until RFCs have been accepted and things have been stabilized, no nothing set in stone. Uh, just so you know that. Um, so yeah. What is async Rust? Uh, well, at, at its basis, um, you may have seen this, which is an async function, uh, does a little thing inside of it. And then uh, if you want to call it, you can only call it really from other async functions. And when you call it, you got to uh, do dot await, and then, then it works. E e easy enough, right? So um, what actually happens under the hood um, is, is a little bit different for async functions. When we have a non-async function, like a regular function, what we do is we uh, perform a function call. And after a function call completes, directly after, uh, we get the output. So you call a function, you get the output. Simple enough. Um, async functions are a little bit different. Because what happens is, instead of getting a function call and directly an output, we get an intermediate step. We get an intermediate computation that we can do stuff with. Um, that intermediate computation is, is what we call a future. And the way we get the output from that future uh, is, is by a method called future pull. Um, but, th but this intermediate step is, is pretty interesting because you know you, you get back a struct and that struct may give us a value, but it's, it's a struct, it's a type, it's an intermediate thing. You know, um, We get to call pull on it multiple times until it like returns pull ready with the value, or we get to not do that. We get to not call it, we can even like drop it. We can maybe call pull on it once. We can call pull on it once and then not call it for a while and then call it again, right? We, we get to choose what we do with a computation and, and that enables us to do a lot of other stuff. Um, oh yeah, ju just so you know like what a future looks like, this is the trait, it's pretty complicated. You don't need to think about it, but now, now you've seen it um, at, at least on slide once. Um, so yeah. Uh, control over over computation the, the intermediate thing um, it, it gives us like some some benefits the the, the first one is control over uh, suspending cancellation pausing resuming of any async function um, when you're writing non async rust you have to um, I say you you have to think about how do I want to implement cancellation for this thing can I implement cancellation for it like there, there's no real standard interface. But with async Rust, any future can be canceled. Um, any future can be suspended. Any future, you, you get like fine-grained control there. Then the, the second thing it enables is uh, ad hoc concurrency. You can have multiple futures, multiple async functions, and execute them concurrently. We'll, we'll go into more detail of like what that exactly means in, in, in a second here. But um, like every async computation can be made concurrent. 
um, sort of like as, as by the shape, the, the interface allows it, where it logically makes sense is the second thing, but there, there's nothing really stopping you there. Um, and then the, the final sort of superpower, the, the benefit of async functions that provides to you is fine grained control. Like you, you get to combine, <laughs> sorry, you get to combine uh, this control over execution and concurrency. And you get, them, get to, to put them together to, to do new things. Um, for example, a timeout. You can think of a uh, timeout is, is two futures, one future T and one timer future. And then you, you run them concurrently. And if the regular future completes first, then we get an OK and we, we drop the timer. But if the timer completes first, then we drop the other future and we say, uh, that's an error. That's a timer error or something, right? So it's, it's concurrent execution of two futures and uh, that gives us timeouts. And, and cancellation is, is tied into that too. Um, yeah. So, you know, I um, I recently published a post about, about this exact topic, like why async rust. And I, sh I showed this little table at the end of it, which is um, at the basis, async rust gives us control over execution, which in turn gives us cancellation. Oh, just double checking, Sa sounds okay. No, nobody's saying anything. Oh no, that's just my no, myself, okay. <laughs> All right, so we have control over execution, which in turn gives us cancellation and concurrency, which in turn we can compose to do interesting new things. And there, there's like a bunch of things we can do there. Um, so yeah, uh, yes, all right. <laughs> so um, another important thing when we're talking about async Rust is that async in Rust is pretty different than async in many other languages. Um, like what we have is, is futures uh, and not tasks. For example, JavaScript um, has an underlying runtime, the, the event loop. And when you say promise uh, new or new, new promise, sorry, um, it schedules um, a thing on the event loop and it immediately starts executing and you get back a handle that you can observe the result from. Uh, with a future, everything's lazy. J just like Rust iterators are lazy, uh, Rust uh, futures are, are lazy as well. Like they, they won't do anything. They're not scheduled anywhere. They're just a fancy way of defining state machines. Um, which means that th this sort of like primitive, it, it, it allows us to do uh, many, many things that may be harder to do in like other languages. Um, the concurrency primitives, they're not implemented in some sort of runtime. They're just library code that, that cleverly combine the, the properties of futures that create new sorts of state machines. Um, and yeah, yeah, we, we don't need a runtime to, to achieve concurrency, which is very nice as well. So um, what, what's stable today? Uh, we have uh, the future trait and ways to construct future, like pin and pull are needed. Um, we have async functions, async uh, uh, scopes. Uh, what do we call them? Block scopes? Yeah, whatever. Um, and we have await. <laughs> and then, then finally, we have uh, into future. Uh, which has been stable for uh, exactly one week now. Uh, that that that's it. <laughs> the the two first items were stabilized in twenty nineteen, and the last one was stabilized last week, and and that that's all we got. Uh, <laughs> so what what's coming up next? Yeah yeah, it's it's a real MVP. Um, so what what's coming up next? Uh, async functions and traits um, currently being worked on. They're already in nightly uh, right now. You you can try them out. Um, and we hope to have them stable next year, hopefully, sometime next year. P people are very actively pushing for this. Um, so yeah, th this is what an async function and traits look like. Uh, you have, say we have an async iterator, async fn next will be expressible. You'll, you'll be able to do that. Um, then the next thing uh, that we're working on right now is for await in loops. Um, RFC is a work in progress. Uh, I'm writing it. Um, and hopefully we'll have it in some form or shape in nightly by the end of this year, I, I hope. Um, there's not much missing there. Um, it's for await uh, page in database users. There, there's reasons why it's not uh, page.await, but instead it's for await um, patterns and stuff. I, I won't go into it. Um, and then finally, keyword generics, which is another thing I'm involved with um, that um, allows you to be generic over asyncness. So again, the iterator trait. Right now, today in standard lib, we have stood iterator, iterator. Oh, <laughs> the free meeting will end in 10 minutes. Uh-oh, I might drop off at some point. <laughs> Help organizers. <laughs> um, 
anyway, I'll, I'll keep going for 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll, we'll see where we are at and, and whether we have to reconnect. Um, anyway, um, so trait async iterator is the async version of it, but, um, <laughs> we'll have another meeting. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, but, but be, better than having like two traits where the only difference is that we have async fn uh, for one of them, but the, the rest of the signatures are the same, is if, if we could be uh, generic over asyncness. So here we would see uh, a trait, an async iterator that has a generic param that allows us to maybe be async um, optionally. We're, we're working on it. It's a whole like design thing. Um, whether it'll work out, we don't know, but you know, th this seems promising. Um, kind of like after that, uh, things like async drop, th this is way further out in the future. I don't know when we'll have this, but we, we just know we want it. Um, async drop, async version of drop. So you can do async stuff in drop, uh, async closures. Um, so you can have async FN mute, et cetera. Um, async standard lib. So you can have async files or async TCP streams, et cetera. Like the, the, these are all things that we want, but you know, they're, they're further down the line. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's the, oh, async main's the last one. Um, so you can just run async code. Um, anyway, that, that, that's sort of the roadmap where we're at with the working group, what we're working on, what's closer by, what's further away. And one of the things that I hope we can have like a little bit closer is, um, static async concurrency. But before we go into that, like what, what is async concurrency? What, what is concurrency at all? Right. Um, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about concurrency and um, parallelism, sometimes even like interchangeably where they, they you know, they, they use both words, um, but they're, they're not interchangeable. They're, they're actually two, two different things, but it, it makes sense that people use them almost as synonyms at, at times because they're, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll explain. So um, concurrency is best thought of as a way to schedule work, um, you know, like a uh, JavaScript is famously single threaded, but the, the workloads on it are still concurrent. There's like callbacks and promises and all that stuff. And it, it's single threaded, but still concurrent. Um, parallelism is a, is a resource. Uh, so your computer will have cores or hardware threads. And it, it says, hi, I have a max parallelism of say 10 because it has 10 cores, right? It says I can run max 10 things at the same time, right? Like you, you can schedule much more concurrent work, but that, that won't run at the same time. Like physically in your computer, 10 computations will be able to be run at the same time. So parallelism is a maximum. It says, this is how much I can run uh, concurrent, like par in parallel, <laughs> I almost made the same mistake. Um, you can find out how much parallelism you got using the thread available parallelism, um, which is a standard lib API. And you know it will it will either error or give you a number bigger than one. It's it's non-zero u size uh, that returns. Um, so concurrency can be single-threaded. That that's fine. You don't need to be multi-threaded. But inversely, just because something is parallelizable doesn't mean it's actually executing concurrently. So here's an example of that. Right? Say we we have a global lock, some global mutex, and we spawn ten threads. And every thread takes like requires taking out a lock on that like mutex, right? It says, "Hi, I need the lock to run." Then the workload will be sequential, like only one thread will make progress at the same time, and like one thread will make progress, and nine threads are waiting essentially, right? That that's not parallel execution. It is multi-threaded, yes, but but the execution ordering is is sequential, right? So it, it doesn't mean you you automatically get concurrent execution if something is parallelizable, right? Um, so yeah, um, in, in non-async Rust and default Rust, uh, concurrency and parallelism are exposed through the same resource, uh, namely thread, thread spawn. Um, so yeah, here, say we have a computer with 10 cores, we spawn a thousand threads, um, like we'll have all thousand threads scheduled, but only 10 will make progress at the same time. And the, the thread scheduler, your OS thread scheduler, will make sure that some are made progress and then others, and that they sort of progresses evenly, right? So you can have more, you can schedule more concurrency, you can schedule more threads than what you actually can run, but the, the scheduler ensures that that they're like that they're scheduled, <laughs> which means um, threads are a unit of parallelization. They're parallelizable, but they're not necessarily run in parallel, um, you know. So yeah, 
uh, async rust, um, concurrency and parallelism are actually separated at the API level. They're, they're not the same thing. Um, you get single thread concurrency by default. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that in depth. Um, there, but they, they can be made parallelizable if you, if you want them to be. So you, you get finer control rather than saying like thread spawn, which is always parallelizable. You get to say like, hey, I want par like concurrency in this way and optionally also make it parallelizable. Um, yeah, examples later on. Um, so what, what's the state of async concurrency in Rust right now? Um, it's entirely defined by libraries. Nothing's stabilized. Nothing's decided in terms of APIs. Um, but we're working on it. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, check out the futures concurrency library on Crates.io if you just want to skip to, okay, what, what exists here? What, what, are, what is going to be proposed most likely? Um, so yeah. Um, all right. Final little pit, bits of what, what is async concurrency um, comes in roughly two flavors, um, right? The, the topic we'll be talking about right now, which is static. Like we know the number of futures um, that we got. So for example, here uh, we say, hey, we have a vector of futures, which contains two futures, or we have an array of two futures or a tuple of two futures, right? That like we, we know it's, it's two. Like it, it's not more, it's not, it doesn't change over time. It's, it's fixed. Um, then there's dynamic concurrency. And that is when, when stuff changes over time, like here's a TCP listener example. So it, it accepts incoming connections. Um, and here the number of concurrently executing, uh, like the number, yeah, yeah. The, the number of concurrent, um, connections, it, it grows and shrinks over time. Right, like as we get more connections, it grows, and as connections are closed, it closes. But the the concurrency here is is variadic. It it it's dynamic, right? So we we it's not fixed. So that's a whole other topic. We're not gonna go into that. So um, yeah, the the final sort of distinction here is um, there's two types of items we can be concurrent over. We can have futures, which are singular values. Uh, ooh, <laughs> okay, I got the new zoom zoom link. Uh, yes. Okay. So we, um, we have, uh, singular futures, um, which produce single values. And then there's iterators, which produce multiple values. Um, in, in the case of async rust, we have async iterators. Um, in the case of sync rust, they're just regular iterators In in non-async rust, the, the, we, uh, or yeah, anyway, <laughs> the, 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 the way I think about futures is as async values really. Right. Um, yeah. Anyway. All right. We'll, we'll first look at, at futures. All right. Static async concurrency. Let's switch over to a new Zoom meeting. <laughs> uh, let me do that real quick. Can everyone see it? Th 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 <laughs> Amazing. I saw one thumb appear. Perfect. <laughs> nice. I, I get to see everyone. Hey, everyone. Um, I, I was kind of looking at myself there, but it's it's nice to see y'all. Yay. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. All right. All right. Stat static case and concurrency. The the title of the talk. Uh, we're we're gonna dive in and hopefully show show what this is actually about. So um, we're we're gonna start with with the futures aspect of it. Like, um, say, say we have a, n a number of futures, like what, what can we do with that? What are the concurrency modes that we can execute? Right? So the first one is what if we wanted to, we have a number of futures and we want to get all of the outputs of, of those futures, right? Um, we would call join for that. So in, in this example, you've got future a and you've got future B. And we say, we put them in a tuple and then we say join and then we await it. And then we get the outputs of future A and B out, right? So we, we don't lose any data. We just say, hey, these two things, I just want both at, like bo both outputs and I'll, I'll wait until both are complete. And it allows us to run both concurrently and then we get it out. Um, that, that's sort of the, the basic one. Instead of like awaiting a single value, you await multiple values concurrently, right? Um, then there, there's there's another one, which is what if we're not interested in all values, but we're only interested in the first value. Um, future race is is what you use for that. The, the example I like to use for this is say we have some sort of local cache on disk and something on the network. 
um, and we just want whatever output we know we can get first. So we check the cache, but we also send out the network request. And then we, we want whichever one returns first, um, right? That's race. In this case, it says like, hey, uh, we take future A and B, um, give us the first one that completes first, right? Uh, this is just like make make believe futures, um, but in in a real example, you 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 know we put other values in there. Um, here here we also we don't get multiple values out. We just get a single value out. We don't know whether A or B completes first, so we just get some value that we know to be U eight out, but we don't know which of the two futures. And when when one completes, the others are canceled in this case as well. Um, so yeah. Now. Oftentimes, futures are used not just by themselves, but we, we compose them with other effects. Uh, most commonly, fallibility, like uh, a future will return a result because the, the future is doing maybe some I.O., whether it's network or file or, or something like that, right? So you get a future of result. Um, so we, we can add that, add that to, to this. Um, future join is now continuing error. Um, future race. Uh, if there's an error, it doesn't care. But what, what if we want to change those semantics slightly, right? What if um, we had a VEC of futures which return results, and if one of the futures um, has an error, then we're no longer interested in any of the outputs. We only want the outputs if they're all okay, right? So in that case, we could use the try join method that um, here we have two futures that are okay. I, I didn't add all the TurboFish syntax. It's, it's a make-believe example. Um, th this will not run, but but just, you know, <laughs> try, trying to illustrate a point. Here we have two futures that return okay, and then we try join it, and we await question mark it. Um, we get back out both outputs, which is nice. But if one of them is an error, then um, we actually won't get the outputs. We'll just get the error that's observed. Uh, and all the other futures are then canceled, right? That, that's the try aspect. Um, this is pretty useful when you're, you're trying to bubble up, propagate um, results and propagate errors in, in the case something goes wrong because you don't want to continue so you're no longer interested in all the other computations. You just want to bubble up the error as soon as it's it, you detect one, right? Um, so that that's try join. There's also try race, which is maybe a bit of a weird name. Maybe it should be called first okay or something like that, but uh, still figuring out the name for it. But it's it's the inverse of race. So um, again, with the example of uh, say we have some cache and some network, imagine we're like calling the network and the internet's out, right? And it says, hey, uh, network's out, here's an error, right? Well, we don't care. We don't, we don't actually care that the network's out. What we're interested in is the first output, the first OK output, right? If the network is out, then well, we we just want to we'll just wait for the cache then, right? And if the cache then does yield a result, then we're happy. That was good. So try race in, inverts that relationship, and it says, well, if we're interested in the first uh, OK result, and it will if it detects an error first, like a future completes with an error, it says, ah, I don't care, I'll keep going until um, I've exhausted all of my inputs. Um, so in this case, um, you know, you, you like both are okay and we get some answer. But here, um, future B actually returns an error and the question mark here won't trigger. Uh, instead, we'll always get um, the answer of one because that is the okay value. So, you know, even if error returns first, uh, completes first, then we'll always get the other one. So that's that's try race. Um, now for for ergonomics, it, it becomes a little bit interesting because um, as I mentioned, Rust 164, which came out last week, added into future, and it it will allow us to. We, we haven't decided whether we want to actually do it or not, but we're thinking about it potentially. Um, it will allow us to improve the ergonomics of of join a little bit. So I explained join in terms of like, what if instead of awaiting a single value, you can await multiple values and get back all of their results. Um, what if you could not have to call join in between? So here you just have a tuple of A and B and you call await on it and it will know to resolve both futures to both outputs. Um, the way this is implemented or can be implemented under the hood is by implementing into future um, for the tuple, and what await now does 
um, it's it's neo the desugaring is neo. This all stabilized like last week, but await calls into future before awaiting the actual future, just like a iterator like for x in y calls into iterator um, on on the thing you're iterating over before doing the actual iteration. So you can do four fields in hash map or in my hash map, and you'll you'll just get the fields immediately. It does the conversion for you. Await now does that as well, which means the tuple itself doesn't need to implement future. It just needs to know how to give you something that implements future. Um, and that, that means we'll, we'll be able to do something like this, most likely, potentially, maybe, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I, 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 I'd like it. But yeah, um, anyway, that, that's it for like um, scalars. Now, now for the, the semantics of uh, sequences. Uh, merge semantics is, is a big one. Like say we have uh, a number of async iterators and we're interested in all of their outputs as soon as they're available, then we can do something like this. So here we have uh, four streams. Stream is an old word for what we now call async iterator. Um, we updated the RFC, but the ecosystem hasn't updated yet. So you, you'll kind of see both terms in use right now, but the, the actual end term will be async iterator. Um, so here you, you have a number of like uh, streams, right? Async iterators. Um, we can all put them together and we say merge these iterators. And as soon as values become available from them, um, yield them, make them available in the iterator. So here we'd be able to get all of the output, never drop any of the output. And, you know, as soon as it's available to us, we, we get it. Um, that, that's what merge does. It's, it's sort of the, the, the join equivalent of like async iteration. Um, there's things like zip and concat, I believe. I, I don't know. But th those do one after the other. So it says first exhaust uh, stream A, then exhaust stream B, then exhaust stream C. What this does instead, it says all at the same time. And as soon as a value is available, yield that value. Um, which is a bit different and, and unique to async Rust as well because it, it's concurrency. So um, you may be wondering if you've done any async Rust at all, you may have like seen select. It's it's mentioned in the async book from the working group. It, Tokyo uh, uses this in their docs as well. Um, and and select is is a macro that allows you to build async concurrency. Um, so yeah, people may be wondering about this. Let let's talk about this briefly. Um, so, uh, oh, wait, hold on. I messed up the, <laughs> the ordering of my slides. All right, all right, all right, all right. So say, say we wanted to, to merge, um, to, to some twi some sequences of like numbers. Um, the way we could write it would be like this. So we have, uh, streams A and B, which, which are iterators over numbers. Then we, uh, merge both and we loop over them and we say, Hey, uh, each number that we see, please add it to the total. And then we assert for the total. Um, even shorter would be something like this, which is um, you create the two streams, and then you merge it, and you call sum, which is provided by a sum trait, uh, and then you await it, which knows to sum all the values in one go. Um, this is all like, yeah, th th this is the shortest you could like possibly get this, probably. Um, so yeah, to, to show you what select is, um, I don't want to go too deep into how it exactly works. Uh, that could be like a, a hour long talk just by itself to discuss all the minutia. I have a blog post on it. I'll, it's linked at the end, but, um, ju just to give you a little bit of a difference, uh, first you must create streams, which are fused. Um, so they keep returning none. Don't worry about it. Um, then you create a loop with a select statement inside of it. Then, um, this is kind of like a fancy match statement, which has a final block. And then we need to check whether the item we had was a sum or a none, and then we can add it to the total. And it's a lot, <laughs> right? The loop with the select and there's stuff with like cancellation involved and retries. And th this is hard. This is pretty hard because, you know, th this is the, the other thing that's like, you can't misuse it. I hope people can like understand this, but th this is quite a bit. Um, so I don't love select. Um, in itself, it's just the building block to build other concurrency modes with. Um, you can implement join, race, and other things through it. Um, but it, it has like many, many issues. It's like too flexible. So I'm, I'm zooming in on this because it's like recommended everywhere. So I want to mention it. 
um, it's recommended as a, as a thing to do concurrency with, like in, in many places. So I just want to highlight it and be like, I don't, you know, please maybe don't use this. Um, actually, like even stronger than that, I don't think we'll be able to add this to standard lib in, in any like good way. Um, like it's, it's super flexible. If you make a mistake, the compiler will not help you. It's a big macro. Uh, it doesn't know what you're trying to do actually. Um, if you make a mistake, you can lose data. It can corrupt your data. Um, and, and yeah, we, we don't know how we would possibly add this to standard lib. Um, so instead of select, I recommend using merge. <laughs> um, and there, there's stuff for like dynamic concurrency, which we're not talking about today, but there, there are some other things as well. But sort of, sort of the, the big sort of tent of, of this stuff is um, instead of like creating building blocks that you can use to build concurrency with, uh, what we're trying to do instead is just give you the concurrency primitives, things like join, like race, like merge, that can be used to achieve one type of concurrency and you can't really hold it wrong. Like it will always do that thing and there there are no gotchas with it. There, you know. So uh, yeah, ch check out Futures Concurrency 3 for a deep dive on all the details if, if you're using select or are wondering about select. Um, so yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I promised, um, futures, uh, <laughs> futures allow you to separate concurrency from parallelism. So what, what if we want to introduce parallelism, right? What, what do we do? What changes here? Um, well, you should just be able to do this. So we, we have a future and we say dot par and now it's parallelizable. You do it two times and now both are parallelizable. Um, yay, that, that, that's it. That's all you should need to do. Um, you can check out the Tasky crate, um, which is published on Crate.io, which which gives you these semantics. I think it's called dot spawn instead of dot par, um, but it it yeah it allows you to do exactly this. It reuses the existing concurrency operators uh, like like join and race, um, but it just says instead of having a single thread future, you have a parallelizable future that when called may move to a different thread or may be put on a different thread and work there. Um, it does require runtime. We will probably not stabilize this until we have runtimes figured out in the standard lib, et cetera. Um, we don't know when that will happen, but th this is more or less the direction that um, at least I would like us to go that I think makes most sense. Um, there's stuff about structured concurrency as well that this in in interleaves with nicely, but yeah, I, I won't bore y'all <laughs> with those details. Um, all right. So next steps uh, for async concurrency, static async concurrency, um, the library futures concurrency is still missing the trivariance. We have it in macro form, we have it in method form, we don't have it in trade form yet. So we, we need to do it as part of that library to show that that can be done and what that looks like, et cetera. Um, we have a low performance thing that we wanna like improve. We know how to do it, we just haven't done it. Uh, right now, waking, in case you care about details, waking is exponential time. Uh, we know how to make it run in ON time. That's a little thing that people sometimes bring up, like, hey, it's slower. And it's like, no, it doesn't have to be. Um, then finally, uh, write an RFC to propose adding the base concurrency methods, the static ones, probably starting with join, maybe including race, uh, explaining how into future might help us with the ergonomics there and kind of move from there. Um, yeah. <laughs> And um, once that's like sort of implemented, we can start looking more at the at the non-static async concurrency. Things like, for example, supervisors, how do they work with this? What happens when you have multiple um, open connections and one of them errors? What type of policies is useful? What type of teardown and do you want to do? How do these things relate to each other, right? How do we make this efficient? There, there, there are a lot of questions around it. Um, and we, we don't have them answered yet. So there'll be like more research, more exploration, uh, in the future. So yeah, if you want to read more about anything I've talked about in this talk, you can check out <laughs> futures concurrency one on my blog, number two, <laughs> number three, <laughs> number four, <laughs> there's a library. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty consistent with my naming, I guess. Um, yeah. And that's, that's it. That That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if we're doing questions. I don't know if I've like how I'm doing with time. Um, happy to take them if there's time, but otherwise happy to move on as well. Uh, I 
can't hear any sound, by the way. Oh, that's, that's a great question. So um, to, to repeat a question, um, I showed an example using arrays. Um, arrays need to be the same type. How would, um, how would you do a race for, for different uh, types of futures? Um, the answer there is to use tuples. Uh, in a tuple, the type of future doesn't need to be the same type. Um, like in, in user space, <laughs> you can uh, implement traits for tuple of two, tuple of three, tuple of four. We don't yet have variadic tuples uh, in the standard lib. Um, implementing this trait, maybe we, we would want variadic tuples. That may be a requirement for the, the, the different valued ones. Um, as a workaround though, like the, the array version, we should be able to stabilize. There, there's nothing blocking stabilization inherently. Um, the workaround you can use for that is instead um, to normalize the output of the different futures by mapping it to an enum before awaiting. Um, bit of a hack, but you know, if, if we can only stabilize part of it and we don't have variadic tuples, it, it will get the job done. Um, anyway, <laughs> that, that, does that answer your question? Amazing, great. That's a great question that I wish I had slides for. Um, <laughs> it is very annoying, but I can, wait, if I can jump back to the slide that shows it, it's the table. Um, I should still be sharing my, oh, here we go. Oh, oh, oh my God. There, there, there it is, yes. So, um, that, that's why I was saying, um, try like good, good, good. You spotted it first of all, but yeah, that's why I was saying about like try race is a bit of a weird name because it, it's not actually a try operation like most others are. So may, maybe it's just a bad name. Um, but if you, um, if you look at the, the left column, right? Um, like race will return early on error. If we're racing, um, two futures and one of them errors, just the race operation, not try race. And one of them errors, then we'll, we won't be observing the, the resultness of it. We'll just be looking at it and be like, oh, hey, the, the, this thing completed first, cool. You still get the error out, right? So it gets back first. It's only once we start looking at the actual, is this a result or not, um, that we, you know, we observe an error and we say, well, actually, that was just the first error. We know there's more futures happening still. We, we haven't touched our case yet or whatever, right? Um, so you, you continue, you, you ignore the error and you continue and you, tr you keep trying the other one, which is the inversion of, of join, which indeed um, you join and there's an error, you, you drop everything because now there's an error, right? So that, that's short circuiting, which is very unintuitive. Uh, maybe it should be called first okay or something, future first okay <laughs> instead, I, I don't know. But, the, but the, the, does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So the, the question is, um, yeah, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, so the, the question is, uh, other, yeah, Rx libraries exist in the ecosystem. Are we planning to add all the operators from Rx libraries as well for async iterators? Um, the, the short answer is no, not quite. Um, what we're planning, so the, the thinking about like async Rust in general within the working group, it, for me especially, right? I, let, let me not speak for others. Let, let me just speak for myself. Um, async Rust um, is a superset of non-async Rust, and we should think of it as mirroring um, non-async Rust. So today we have std iter iterator, right? And we're actually the whole std iter submodule. Um, what we want to do is we want to match all the methods that exist on iterator, things like map, collect, um, zip, all of them, um, and extend it only to do things that relating to concurrency, right? Things like merge is a, is an operation that only exists in async rest because it does concurrency. Um, but sort of outside of the, the concurrency extensions, um, make sure that uh, the synchronous uh, iterator and the asynchronous iterator have the exact same APIs. Um, and we, we cover a lot of what, what the Rx libraries already do uh, with iterator, and maybe we'll have more of them, but, but for async specifically, just make sure that the two stay, stay in lockstep with each other. Um, and I, I don't think anyone has plans to like add every single operation, but it'll probably grow over time. 
So yeah, m maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, does that answer your question? Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the question is, um, embedded runtimes such as Embassy exist. Um, it's, it's all cool that we have like these concurrency things, but how, how will they interact? What's the, what's the story going forward with the standard lib concurrency embedded? That, that, that's a really good question. Um, so everything I've shown today, um, except for the, the parallelism bit, the, the dot par stuff, um, will work on embedded runtimes. Um, there, there's nothing inherently about it that, that wouldn't work. It's, it's composition of state machines that will like live uh, on the stack, there, there, there's nothing really fancy about that, or, or incompatible about that. So, most of this talk will will just quote air quotes just work. Um, the the question about like async and embedded and compatibility more widely that's a really good question. Um, like we'll we'll want as much stuff to work as possible, um, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there, there are like real challenges in like defining a generalized interface for say spawning a task that will work on embedded platforms. Not all embedded platforms are the same. Um, some can allocate, some can't allocate. Like how far do we push it? Um, the, the answer there is we are working with um, Dario, the maintainer of Embassy, um, and we have regular calls well, regular being <laughs> once a year at this moment, but uh, we're, we're trying to like ensure that every proposal stays in the loop, ensures that we cover as much ground as possible and that, that you know, embedded too, we, we want to provide a, a sort of consistent feeling user experience for all the platforms. Um, but yeah, you're, it's challenging, but you know, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're pretty committed to, to making it work. Um, that, that, does that answer it? <laughs> so the question is, what about async drop? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Um, there's a blog post by Sabrina Jusen titled Async Drop, which explains some of the difficulties of async drop. Um, privately, I think we, I may have a design that will work for async drop. Um, I'm having a chat with uh, other people on the working group in two weeks to sort of vet the design, to talk through the problem space more. Um, it's, it's kind of like the one least solved aspect of the, of the core building blocks, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it's solvable. I, I think it is. Um, I think, I think I may even have a design, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't want to call victory too soon. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working on it is, is the longer answer. It'll, it'll take a moment to, to completely figure out, but yeah, we're, yeah. <laughs> does does that make sense? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I hope I'm like not announcing something too public. Um. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone. <laughs>